A team of AI scientists from Google DeepMind, OpenAI, and XAI have branched out to explore brain-inspired architectures, unveiling a revolutionary new AI called Hierarchical Reasoning Model, or HRM. The tiny 27 million parameter HRM has shown remarkable performance on complex reasoning tasks, achieving near-perfect accuracy on challenges like intricate Sudoku puzzles, and finding optimal paths in large mazes where state-of-the-art models from OpenAI, Anthropic, and and deep seek score zero. But this video isn't just about a new model. It's about the pendulum of AI swinging back. About how this breakthrough isn't just an improvement. It's a radical departure from the current norms. It resurrects some of the oldest, most foundational ideas in AI. And is a breath of fresh air that was so desperately needed to move the field into the next paradigm. Even NVIDIA, the primary beneficiary of large data centers and massive models, published a paper just a week later, declaring that small language models are the future of agentic AI. To be frank, it's probably all this guy's fault, Richard Sutton, a Canadian Turing award-winning computer scientist and one of the founders of modern computational reinforcement learning. If you don't know, just like the political left and right, the AI research community is divided into two groups. On the one hand, we have the AI scalers. They believe bigger models, more data and compute are always the answer and that human design is just in the way. The less human decision making, the better the AI will get. On the other hand, you have the AI designers, who argue that intelligent design and sophisticated algorithms are everything, and blindly scaling without understanding the underlying mechanisms will lead us to a dead end. Not literally though, most AI scientists deeply understand both sides of the argument, but it's a matter of priorities. But in March of 2019, Richard Sutton became something like the president of the AI world, writing the legendary blog post, Bitter Lesson, where his idea has won the election of AI research. And as they say, a scale paled a generation of researchers. He wrote, The bitter lesson is that the actual contents of minds are tremendously, irredeemably complex. We should stop trying to find simple ways to think about the contents of minds, such as simple ways to think about the space, objects, multiple agents, or symmetries. All these are part of the arbitrary, intrinsically complex outside world. They are not what should be built in as their complexity is endless. Instead, we should build in only the meta methods that can find and capture this arbitrary complexity. And he cited multiple instances of difficult AI challenges like Go, Chess, and Computer Vision, all of which were solved using algorithms that relied on extracting features and patterns from data with more compute, rather than relying on handcrafted rules and regulations. Why would we ever try to come up with the rules and regulations of the system when we can let the system find the best ones on its own? Tesla made its self-driving system more end-to-end, -end, removed most of the handcrafted rules in favor of bigger networks and more data, and it was a tremendous improvement. Language models and general-purpose AI experienced an unbelievable jump in capabilities by just embracing it and relying on deeper networks, more data, and more compute. And with each success, more and more scientists joined the camp, some of them suppressing their instinct in favor of the evidence. And every time I said QKV and GPU go purr, that's all there is to it. I died a little inside. So a trillion dollars later, why are we talking about the smaller AI, modular systems, which inherently means more design, and looking for a structure more than a scale? That's where the HRM, or hierarchical reasoning model, enters the picture, hitting the pendulum of AI in the opposite direction. Direction. It finally puts a crack in the idea that the only thing we need to reach AGI is sheer scale and brute force. Sapient Intelligence, the company behind HRM, believes that biology actually has done the same thing. The human brain wasn't trained end to end to be the absolute miracle of a problem solver that it is today. Nature slowly included more and more modules and made the brain more and more powerful. But even an insect is able to self-sustain in the brutal, complex and dynamic world with its tiny brain. HRM argues that for complex multi-step reasoning, what you need is not just a bigger brain, but a better organized one. This is where its genius lies. It organizes computational brain like a small, highly effective company with just two employees. First, you have the high level or the H module. Let's call it the CEO. The CEO is the strategist. It operates on a slow time scale thinking deliberately about the big picture. The CEO doesn't get its hands dirty filling in the individual numbers in the Sudoku grid. Instead, it looks at the entire board and makes a strategic judgment. Like that top right box is nearly full. It's the most constrained area and probably the key to unlocking the next wave of deductions. 
Let's focus all of our energy there for a while. Second, you have the low level or the L module. This is the worker. This is a blur of activity. It operates on a very fast clock, taking the CEO's high level directive and executing it with relentless detail oriented focus. Given the order to focus on the top right box, the worker will perform dozens of rapid logical steps. If this cell is seven, then that one can't be, which means that one must be a four. Wait, that creates a conflict and so on. The worker is the one doing the logical cross-hatching and rule-checking, but only within the strategic scope set by the CEO. This is the brain with two clocks. The CEO thinks and updates its grand strategy, but only occasionally. The worker, guided by that single strategy, thinks and updates its detailed understanding constantly. This temporal separation is what prevents the model from getting stuck on a bad idea. The worker finds a local solution or hits a dead end, reports back, and the CEO uses that new information to to issue a fresh, smarter strategic directive, effectively resetting the worker for a new sprint on a more promising part of the problem. So far, HRM might sound like just another agentic framework, but the key is that it's actually not. It's a radical departure from the current norms. The worker and the CEO are not language models, and they don't communicate in English. The breakthrough is HRM marries the two almost opposing sides of the modern AI architectures, the recurrent neural networks and massive feedforward transformers blocks to finally fix both and give us a third option that sounds too good to be true. Recurrent neural networks used to be on the top of the field. It just made sense that RNNs are the way to go because our brain is a recurrent network, meaning the flow of information moves both ways and multiple times. All the neurons inform each other forward and backward until the network settles into an equilibrium. This helps us to hold the thought, play with and refine it efficiently until we reach a conclusion. But the problem is artificial RNNs tend to settle for the first good enough answer. Or as the paper calls it, they suffer from early convergence. On the other hand, we have the current LLMs that get around the early convergence problem at a huge cost. The modern LLM is a brilliant expert who never double checks. Although it is just incredible at one-shot answers, it has no native mechanism for iteratively refining its thought. Data enters from one end and inevitably jumps out the other after moving through a fixed number of steps and layers. This is what makes the current AI a shallow reasoner, prone to logical errors and hallucinations because it cannot loop back on its own thinking. It's actually quite mind-blowing that the machine can just intuit hundreds of lines of code without an error. Just imagine how would a human act if there was no system of reflection inside our head. LLMs do actually loop, especially the reasoning ones, but the problem is they have to output words at the end of each loop, and having to compare compress the incredibly rich representations of internal thinking to a single word at the end of each forward pass guarantees some loss of meaning and accuracy. So for years, the entire field was stuck in this architectural stalemate. Choose the RNN, get a deep, loopy architecture that's theoretically powerful, but mathematically unstable and gives up too soon. Choose the transformer LLM, get a stable, powerful architecture that can't actually hold a thought and think iteratively. But HRM breaks this stalemate by taking the best of both words. It embraces the loop like an RNN. It is fundamentally a recurrent iterative machine built for multi-step problem solving. It avoids the early convergence by using hierarchical convergence, where the CEO resets the worker's tasks at the end of each sprint. It acts as a constant jolt to the system. Just when the worker the L module might be about to settle in for a stable inert state, the CEO, the H module, updates its strategy and gives a fresh new problem to solve. This prevents the computational activity from ever fading away, allowing it to sustain deep thought for hundreds of steps. HRM finally delivers on the original promise of recurrent neural networks, a model that not only can think in steps, but can also sustain that thought step after deliberate step until the problem is truly solved. So that's the recurrent part. Where is the marriage with the current LLMs? This gets to the heart of everything we've talked about so far. And the next couple of minutes might be some of the most eye-opening stuff you've ever watched on AI. If you remember from the previous videos, the paper that introduced the transformer architecture that gave rise to the modern AI was titled Attention is all you need. The attention mechanism is what unlocks the power of modern AI, even in HRM. But have you ever wondered what 
do they mean by attention? Before the transformer, there was an extremely difficult problem, plaguing their language processing task. The problem was, although training the models to understand and encode the semantic similarities between individual words was relatively easy, it was basically impossible in the context of a sentence or a paragraph or a book. How would you know which words influence which ones and to what degree? That's when researchers started writing rules, like the words that are closer are more likely to affect each other, or rules based on the classical language grammar separating verbs, adjectives, pronouns, and attaching influence scores to them. As you can probably imagine, none of these sophisticated rules could actually capture the complex structure of human language. That's when the attention mechanism came to the rescue. In the spirit of fewer handwritten rules and more compute, Google researchers came up with an extremely effective combination that extracted the structure of language on its own. Although this is quite a sophisticated algorithm, it's conceptually very simple. They introduced three fundamental vectors of Q, K and V for each word in a sequence. So, for example, in a sentence like the cat sat on the mat, if we want to understand the meaning of sat, we have a Q vector that basically encodes how much other words influence sat. Then we have K, which represents how much sat can influence other words. And finally, we have V which is the result, and it represents the meaning of the word sat influenced by the others. Now instead of handwriting what words influence each other, we let the system learn how much each word should influence others on a one-to-one -one basis. We calculate the dot product of Q and K for every single pair of words in the entire sequence. Then we normalize the results to get an attention score, and the higher the score, the more influence those words have on each other. You might be still thinking, but what's the content of Q and K? We don't actually know, and that's the point. This system is designed to extract the structure of language on its own, and what should be the content of these vectors is learned through trillions of trials and errors. This was a nice touch to avoid writing brittle rules for language, but as it turns out, attention was so much more powerful, almost impossibly more powerful. It turned out that in order to understand the meaning of a word, the network not only encoded how verbs, adjectives, and nouns influence each other, but how a broken glass can hurt, how a sad human might cry, and how a sunset on the sea is considered beautiful. This combination extracted patterns and features that were apparently beyond language, but were necessary to make correct predictions. But it didn't even stop there. It turned out the attention mechanism isn't limited to language. It was the perfect feature detector. It could basically derive patterns out of any sequence of tokens. If it's a picture, it would encode how individual pixels relate and make a circle, or an eye, or a cat. If it's a sound wave, it would encode how individual digital signals would make a character, a word, and eventually a coherent narration of a story with emotions. Knowing that the transformer and the attention mechanism is much more than a word predictor and more like a general purpose feature detector, HRM made both the CEO, the H module, and the worker, the L module, a state-of-the-art transformer blocks. But they are not there to talk to each other in English or learn language. They are there to extract the features and understand the relations in any sequence of data. And that's how you marry recurrent neural networks and attention to make an incredibly smart and efficient learner like HRM. This model is just 27 million parameter and is able to solve extreme Sudoku puzzles and difficult mazes while every other frontier model scores zero on these benchmarks. It even outperforms O3 and Cloud 3.7 on both ArcAGI 1 and 2 while being thousands of times smaller. Moreover, the model learns to solve problems not by training on trillions of tokens, but by just looking at a thousand examples. In fact, this architecture escapes pre-training altogether. And that's much more like how humans learn. We just need a limited number of examples to learn a new skill. Now the question is, so what's the catch? Can this design be better than others in every aspect? The answer is deep thinking, deep Real thinking in the space of ideas, not talking to yourself out loud, comes at a heavy price. It sacrifices the extensive data and knowledge of LLMs for a significant boost in computational depth. As Jan Lacan, the chief AI scientist at Meta always says, LLMs know way too much, and maybe that's a fundamental trade-off in architectures. You can memorize a lot and be a shallow reasoner, or you can be a pure reasoning machine that can't memorize the whole internet. HRM is not a language model, so you can't talk to it, but it's open source and can be taught to solve virtually any cognitive task. It's not a replacement for LLMs, but it's a new species of AI that might take us to the next level. 
So what does this really mean for us? Like how my chatbot is going to get better because of this? Just like you heard about curriculum sampling here months before GPT-5 leveraged it or GLM 4.1 way before it was introduced as a frontier open source model. These leaps in performance don't come out of nowhere. They are initiated in research first. We are just a bit ahead of the news cycle. This time in the research community, the pendulum is changing direction towards more design, smarter architectures, and more modular systems. A shift I know many of you are excited about from your comments. So let's explore why this is happening and what is the role of HRM in this new picture. Theoretically, nothing beats scale and compute. If you zoom in enough, compute is the architecture. They are not separate things. Massive computation essentially explores the vast space of possible configurations, settling on the most effective one. Inside every AI is an inexplicably sophisticated design that emerges out of relentless trial and error, and manual design can't even come close to it. With infinite time and computational power, we could envision an end-to-end -end optimization of the entire planet, driving the optimal outcome for every individual, effectively manifesting a singular godlike intelligence. But practically, we are very close to our current compute limitations. Achieving the next level of AI capabilities, such as performing long horizon tasks, is profoundly complex. While we are rapidly accelerating the production of computational power, the inherent complexity of the problems we aim to solve is exploding even faster. When compute and data can't possibly explore the space of possible configurations for such complex tasks, we have to go back to manual design. This is not a retreat, it's the next step, because now we are making higher leverage decisions and designing more abstract architectures. Even NVIDIA came out to say small language models are the future of agentic AI. In the paper, they argue small language models, or SLIMs, are principally sufficiently powerful to handle language modeling runs of agentic applications, inherently more operationally suitable for use in agentic systems than LLMs, necessarily more economical for the vast majority of LM uses in agentic systems than their general purpose LLM counterparts by the virtue of their smaller size. And they also show with reliable data that a lot of current AI workflows could be replaced by a smaller models that cost 10 to 30 times less. In MetaGPT, we estimate that about 60% of LLM queries could be reliably handled by appropriately specialized SLEMs. 40% in Open Operator and 70% in Cradle. They are saying we are already too big for a lot of tasks. And modular systems are not just good enough, they are fundamentally better. Even Francois Cholet, the creator of ArcAGI Benchmark, says we are probably already too big and we need to look for smarter architectures. I don't think a system that needs to expand um, enormous amounts of compute at this time to solve simple puzzles that a child could solve, I don't think that's is yeah, it looks more like, like brute force to me. Um, in, when, when it comes to intelligence, efficiency, like compute efficiency at this time, is not just a feature of the system. It's not a nice to have. It's actually, a, 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 it's part of the definition of what intelligence is. Intelligence is about uh, doing more uh, with less. It's making the best use of, of your resources. That's what intelligence is. It's data efficiency. It's compute efficiency. Um, so if you get chess, for instance, if you have to... Um, look at every individual move on the chessboard and then all the subsequent moves in order to find the best move, you, you, it doesn't seem like intelligence to me. Intelligence is more being able to look at a few things uh, because you have limited attention and instantly find uh, the optimal move, like a chess master would, would, would do. In this new picture, HRM or HRM-like architectures of pure reasoning can be attached to the current LLMs and basically replicate the system 1 and system 2 thinking paradigm in the brain, where the LLM acts as the impulsive, intuitive, and fast responder, while HRM plays the role of deliberate, deep, iterative thinking. As we've been all waiting for, the field is changing direction toward more deliberate, innovative, and brain-inspired architectures to pair with LLMs or replace them entirely. And HRM, if nothing else, is one of the first ones to show there is a lot of room for improvement. If you want to learn more about the subject, I highly recommend this Medium piece by Arvind Dakaraj, link in the description. This video was heavily inspired by it and I even quoted him directly at some places. If you learned anything from this video, give it a thumbs up and I see you in the next one.